Greetings, friends, fellow enthusiasts of astrobiology and explorers of all ages. And welcome to Ask an Astrobiologist, the show that celebrates the science and celebrates the scientists involved in our quest to understand the nature of life. I'm your host, Dr. Graham Wow, and we're brought to you by the NASA Astrobiology Program and Saganet.org. As always, we want to give a huge shout out to those out there who share about our show and interact with our guests and talk about astrobiology with us on Twitter and all the other places you can find us. Uh, this month, we want to highlight Garrett Campion for sharing on Twitter about today's episode, though later on in the show, we'll also talk about many of you who've been sharing and, and talking about technology and, and instruments in astrobiology. And that's exactly what today's episode is, is going to focus on. We have two researchers from NASA joining us who've both been involved in the technology and the science of astrobiology and how we look for life out there. Just this past week, the NASA Astrobiology Program um, and the ENFOLD, or Network for Life Detection, RCN, together put on a workshop called The Future of the Search for Life, or FOSSIL, bringing together researchers and technologists involved in the synergies and in the intersections of how we develop instruments and technology for conducting life detection science. And both of today's guests were involved in the committee organizing this exact meeting. So without further ado, I'd like to bring both of them on. I'll introduce both first, and then we can say hello. Uh, Dr. Stephanie Getty is the acting director of the Solar System Exploration Division and a planetary research scientist at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Her research interests are in the area of in situ planetary exploration, particularly in the pursuit of understanding the origin and evolution of past and present habitable environments in our solar system. She is currently the deputy principal investigator as well of the Da Vinci mission to Venus. Uh, and then we also have joining us Dr. Richard Quinn. He's a research scientist at NASA's Ames Research Center. He's been involved in a variety of projects involving instrument and technology development for Earth and space exploration, including research in the Atacama Desert on instrumentation for Mars exploration and in technologies for exploring the icy worlds of our solar system. He's also a member of the steering committee for the RCN called the Network for Ocean Worlds, or NOW. Uh, so Drs. Getty and Quinn, thank you both for joining us for Ask an Astrobiologist. Uh, you're welcome. Glad to be here. Glad to be here, Graham. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah, this is super exciting to have you both on. Uh, I wanted to talk to both of you on the show for some time now. But our main impetus was to talk primarily to start off with this workshop that we've convened at NASA Astrobiology and the Unfold. And so I'm wondering, um, I'll start with Stephanie, if you don't mind, what were the motivations for the fossil workshop uh, and what was really the need to have this workshop? Well, that is um, an appreciated question, and I hope that Richard gets a chance to respond to because he's been so central to the organization of this workshop. But of course, you know, life detection is one of those profound um, uh, op opportunities that we have now that we're learning more about habitable environments throughout our solar system and beyond, right? But uh, this workshop really focuses on the concept of being able to go and visit a habitable environment and how would we confidently um, detect life, uh, uh, you know, and answer some questions about uh, the development of life in uh, some of these habitable environments. So we don't yet uh, fully know how uh, how to to do that in a comprehensive way and for all environments. And so we're holding this workshop to really engage um, the communities that are going to be central to answering this question from the science community, uh, really broadly engaging uh, um, not only seasoned planetary scientists but also new minds uh, in the pursuit of this this question. Um, but I also, we also need technologists and we need engineers to realize those goals. So this workshop is really, um, you know, has the objective of bringing together those communities and, uh, and taking a systematic, um, a combination of systematic and kind of creative approaches uh, to, uh, to coming up with new ideas and then following those ideas through to thinking through, you know, what would really face um, those uh, those um, measurements and the and the technologies would be that would be required to become a reality. Fantastic! Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned these different communities that are coming together for this workshop as well. You know, a lot of us think about things like you know engineers tell scientists we can only land in certain places on Mars, but then scientists want to do certain science, and so we have to ask the engineers what can we do. 
Uh, and so, Richard, for you, uh, what do we actually need to do to integrate more of this knowledge from science and, and engineering? Uh, and will this workshop get us there? Or, or what is kind of the long-term product then from this meeting? Well, I think that this workshop is is a start, and there are other um, you know uh, people working to bring these communities together. And and you know early on when people were uh, being invited and in, and started participating, they immediately recognized that there's a real need to get engineers into the conversation early. I think a lot of times um, you know the scientists they have their ideas, their hypothesis, and they pursue it down a path. And it's uh, quite a while before they actually come back to the reality of how do you actually implement this and getting that conversation going with engineers. So I think that this workshop is a really good forum for that, for bringing those two groups together. Wonderful. So I want to step back a little bit with both of you to talk a little bit about the pathways uh, of instrument development. Um, so Stephanie, what instruments have you per personally been involved with, for one thing, um, but then also, what is it like to be a scientist working with these technologies that we send to other worlds? And, and then we have, you know, years of data collection, bringing that information back to us and studying it. There are so many questions in that question, Graham, but I will try to answer them. <laughs> um, so uh, I'll run through the list, I guess. I've, I've watched um, several instruments get built during my career at NASA. Um, they've primarily been in situ analytical instruments, uh, um, typically with mass spectrometry involved. Um, I watched uh, the sample analysis at Mars instrument suite uh, get built and delivered to Mars Science Laboratory, and now it's nearing 10 years of um, incredible operations at Gale Crater on Mars. Um, watched uh, the neutral gas uh, and ion uh, mass spectrometer NGIMS get developed from the MAVEN mission, which is still orbiting around Mars, making discoveries there. Um, uh, ion and neutral mass spectrometer for LADI, uh, which was a, an orbiter around the moon. Um, and then, you know, I was really uh, in the room for a lot of um, the development of the Mars Organic Molecule Analyzer MOMA mass spectrometer, uh, which was delivered to the ExoMars rover. Um, and now I have the real privilege to work uh, in the same groups uh, that are, um, and with the same groups that are developing DRAMS, the Dragonfly mass spectrometer for uh, Titan Titan Moon uh, mission, Dragonfly. Um, <clears throat> and you mentioned I'm a deputy PI, one of the two deputy PIs for Da Vinci, uh, mission to Venus, and we'll be flying the Venus mass spectrometer on that probe through the atmosphere uh, to the near surface of Venus. Um, so, uh, so that's that's my most direct um, connection to in situ instrumentation for spaceflight. And then you kind of asked, um, you know, what does it take to, you know, to really develop these things? I think of it as like kind of a a series of questions. I promise I will not describe all the technology readiness levels um, right now, which there are nine of them. Um, they're called TRLs, um, but I'm not going to talk about them. <laughs> but you can think about a series of questions like, you know, you have a science question, what measurement or piece of measurement do you want to make to answer that science question? How do you do that with a particular instrument or a particular technique? Does that technique work in the lab? Does that thing measure the other thing you're trying to measure with sufficient performance you know can the thing fit on a spacecraft and if not you have to probably build a, a you know a version of it that does um to fit within volume and mass and power requirements of the mission then you ask does the thing still work after you make it small enough to fit on a spacecraft and then you have to test it under the environments that it will experience so not only the environment of the eventual you know mission um, uh, for operate science operations but also will it survive launch and will it if it has to land does it survive the landing conditions so you really put, I mean it's a it's a process that takes years as you might imagine um, but uh, but it's but it's logical and it you know in a, in a, in a series of steps you you just ask these harder and harder questions of the of the thing you want to build that's so awesome I, I do have to say I'm a little jealous with all these instruments you mentioned that you've had involvement with oh, um, no. uh, you know being involved I've been in around you know, yeah, instruments going to the moon and Mars and, and Venus and all these different places I mean that's fantastic and then dragonfly coming up um, that's so cool uh, and, I, and I love you know that you shared with our audience this idea that there are some trade-offs that come into instrument development and how we actually can answer the questions that we're sending these instruments out to do. 
Uh, and so, Richard, I'd like to come to you. You mentioned when we were first prepping for this episode to us that, that instrument development is a process of try and try again. And I wonder if you can, can kind of, you know, go, go deeper on, on that, expound on that idea a little bit uh, with what instruments you've been involved in and, and how is it a process of try and try again? Uh, sure. Um, well, um, I, I can, guess I can start at the beginning, which was quite a while ago. Um, but when I first started in, in this business or in astrobiology, I was dispatched down to uh, JPL's micro devices lab. And I worked on the uh, uh, Mars Occident instrument which was launched on a Russian mission. Uh, unfortunately, it, it, it failed uh, before reaching, um, yeah, there, it was common back then. Um, <laughs> um, but, but that really started a trajectory for technology development in different ways to interrogate environments. And I would say that it, 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 it took two paths. Um, the, the first path is the Mars Oxygen instrument then morphed into, uh, the, the Mars Oxygen experiment morphed into the Mars Oxygen instrument. And that was pursued and pushed towards um, uh, implementation on ExoMars, um, which was initially on the payload, but then got de-scoped. Um, but simultaneously, in another direction, um, the Mars Oxygen experiment was looking at solid regolith material parallel to interrogate the surface chemistry of Mars. We uh, went on a path of developing uh, the, the MECA wet chemistry experiment, which was eventually launched on the Phoenix mission. Um, in the interim, I was involved in another uh, a, a number of, of different technologies that um, were developed. For instance, the first prototype of TIGA, um, which was uh, the thermal evolved gas analyzer, which eventually was also included on the Phoenix mission. And the Mars Oxygen experiment, after getting de-scoped from ExoMars, it was sort of retooled, and finally that technology was implemented on the first astrobiology nanosatellite mission, um, looking at how do um, biological materials, how do organics, how, how are they changed in space environment, and how might we apply that science to, um, to what's happening on other planetary surfaces. Yeah, very cool. So it's pretty much evolution, the progress of some of these things. You know, they might not work sometimes, or we might lose them on launch. But we can still continue, you know, the research forward, which I, I appreciate a lot. Um, that reminds me a lot of the the, the loss of Phobos Grunt many years ago, uh, and the Life Disc that many of us had supported from the Planetary Society uh, going out to Phobos and back. I, I hope to see something similar in the near future. Um, but you said something, something in the very beginning there, Richard. I'd like to come back to. You mentioned environmental context. And I know in talking to you previously that you've done field work before. You've gone to the Atacama and some other places. Uh, I wonder if you could connect to us uh, some of the challenges, one, of doing field work, but then also how, how we make connections from the field to some of the missions you've been involved in. Um, well, that's a really interesting question. In terms of the Atacama Desert, um, I think uh, about almost 20 years ago, I was down there with uh, Rafael Navarro Gonzalez and a number of other researchers, and, and really um, published the first paper in science. You know, the Atacama Desert is a Mars analog, and it sort of set forth this whole, you know, trajectory of research that was done done down in that field. Um, and, and I think that the, the 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 challenges of doing field work and how do you apply it to your science and technology are a little, they're two different things. Uh, I think the technology implementation is a little more straightforward. You go down the Atacama Desert, the water, dirt is very Mars-like. It's, you know, physically it's very similar to Mars, minus atmosphere and things like that. But that allows you to do technology demonstration. More challenging is the science. Um, and in particular, say for the Atacama Desert, the Atacama Desert is vast and most of it is not Mars-like. In fact, you always have to be considering from the science side, um, even you know where it seemingly seems to be like another planet, really how is it and how is it you know, not? Um, and now I think that's really the challenge. I think that it can, uh, it can be a little deceptive. You think you're actually, you get Mars analog field work, but in fact, when you dig down in the science, there are really fundamental differences that need to be understood. Otherwise, um, you know, when you do get to your destination, you might be subject to, to misinterpretations or, uh, you know, not complete understanding. 
I, I, I the NASA Astrobiology Graphic Histories uh, are, are artistic works um, where we explore some of the history of astrobiology uh, at NASA. Uh, Peter Doran is quoted as saying that that analog environments have life-threatening characteristics that's what they share with other worlds. I always like to also remind people that they have life-supporting characteristics too, which is what makes them kind of habitable systems. Uh, and so, Stephanie, uh, I wonder for you, um, in your role at Goddard, uh, what does your team do to bring knowledge from field science into what we're actually using then to look uh, for, for life or for understanding geology in other worlds? Yeah. Oh, I love this question um, because it, you know, it really ties together. Field work is, you know, is one element of how you really prepare to go uh, to another destination and do investigations there. We have our um, our gift team, Goddard Instrument Field Team, with members from Ames as well, um, who go out into a variety of environments that uh, planetary analog environments, um, you know, beyond Atacama, which is you know a, a canonical one and and really great one, um, but also, you know, other other areas to look at uh, lunar um, analog environments, other Mars analog environments, and even, you know, some aspects. It's really hard to emulate an ocean world um, perfectly on Earth, <laughs> but there are some regions of Earth that are really hostile <laughs> and, um, and really energy starved and are good analog environments as well and kind of represent the interface between you know, maybe ice, water, energy sources, um, you know, substrates uh, in terms of rocks and, uh, and mineralogy um, and, and understanding uh, that environment as a system uh, really makes field work critical um, in putting together the pieces and practicing what that data interpretation um, would be like uh, with even less information and less of an ability to go and service your instrument, <laughs> which you have a little bit ability when you're in the field, right? So, um, so uh, the the teams that go out into the field, uh, the ones at Goddard, um, particularly who collaborate a lot with outside um, uh, um, teams as well, um, they have the opportunity to bring back relevant samples to our laboratories at Goddard as well. We have um, chemistry and noble gas laboratories. Uh, lots of analytical capabilities at Goddard and with our partners um, to really help tease out all of the different aspects of what uh, what a sample is made out of, what the environment is telling you. Look at atmospheric phases. You can look at rock phases. You can look at the biology. Um, and so, so that's one benefit of field work is the sample collection aspect. Um, you also have your testing uh, in remote environments um, that you're able to do to really put your instrument, uh, you know, um, through some tough challenges <laughs> on the way uh, to maturing it um, to be ready for spaceflight. Um, and then there's like the operational side. There are advantages um, to being out into the field and testing, you know, operational sequences um, that really respond to the, the um, constraints that you have in planetary exploration on how much you can do in a particular message, mission, how quickly you can do each thing and how investigations build upon each other um, with analysis in between where you can um, to really get to the end goal of answering your, your big science questions. Um, I want to mention one more thing. Um, our gift team has uh, taken the opportunity to bring students into the field, students not only in traditional fields, but also in journalism programs and other programs um, to engage, uh, you know, really all of the diverse um, disciplines that you really need to not only accomplish the science, but communicate that science to a wider audience. It's a really um, exciting, uh, it's a really exciting group to have at Goddard, and I'm privileged to work with them. Oh, that's so cool. I'm so glad you mentioned that. A lot of our viewers are high school students, undergraduate students, graduate students who are very interested in, in how they can become involved in things like field work and instrument development and working at NASA. And so it's great to have those connections for them to hear about. Uh, and I do want to come back to something you mentioned about bringing samples back when you're in the field and bringing them back to Goddard and, and other NASA centers, for instance. But, but one thing you mentioned there, too, was this idea, you know, that we're trying to understand the characteristics of the environment and relate that to these other places. I get that question a lot in public talks. When I'm speaking, especially to children, they, you know, how is this like Mars? How is this like Europa? How is this like Venus? And they also ask, like, big questions. And so we wanted to ask a big question of our Twitter audience. Uh, who follow along at NASA Astrobio on Twitter. 
And we asked them the question of if we had an unlimited budget, which is always kind of a grand hand-waving thing, but if we had an unlimited budget with NASA, what scientific instrument would you develop to search for life beyond Earth? And we had so many really intriguing answers. Uh, Dr. Sean Dumbledore Goldman came on um, and mentioned the Lavoir telescope, um, which you know, we have this idea to build a very cool, large telescope that can look in UV, infrared, visible light, and, and do some really cool things. Uh, several other people mentioned large telescopes like Arecibo or building large telescopes in space. We had people mention drilling through the ice on Europa and different kinds of drills. Dr. Paul E. Lane uh, from Finland mentioned using a terahertz detector to explore biosignatures and watery plumes from Enceladus. Dr. Afshin Khan mentioned uh, building a high-end instrument for looking at chirality and even for concentrating biomolecules or, or biosignatures, which I thought was pretty cool. Uh, we had several answers, like things like warp drive, um, you know, and some higher-end stuff that's kind of out there. Um, maybe the funniest ones, though, we had one person mention that they would build a HAL 9000, um, which, you know, that'd be interesting, like in 2001 A Space Odyssey. Let's just not lie to it. Um, and then someone else, uh, Chris Kalos, uh, shared with us a picture from Pirates of the Caribbean at World's End, where the two captains are battling over who has the longest telescope, um, which I thought was kind of interesting for some of what we've done in the past in building really big telescopes. Um, so for both of you, uh, just a fun question. If you had an unlimited budget, um, what instrument would you want to build and send out there? Uh, Stephanie, how about you? <laughs> oh, <laughs> so much of my life is like responding to the constraints that are put on me. This is a hard question to answer. Yeah, you're free, you're free in this case. <laughs> I know. Whatever you think you could imagine would be awesome. I, w yeah, I would launch all of the Solar System Exploration Division laboratories into space <laughs> because they really complement each other. You know, look at mineralogy, petrology, you know, the organic chemistry um, from various angles, prebiotic chemistry, what can be biological, you know, what can you tell um, from the refractory uh, components of the organic composition? Um, what about the atmospheric chemistry? What about the noble gases? What can they tell you about the evolution of a particular planetary body, where it came from, what's happened to it? Um, all of ultimately our goal right is to is to build upon mission ask question upon question to answer as many of these questions as possible so that we know as much as possible and we're as confident as possible about the conclusions and interpretations that we're drawing from the data sets that we have which are just by nature limited um, uh, when uh, when you when you work in, uh, in situ the finite volume power Absolutely. And there's so many cool mission concepts and, and things being developed out there. I would toss in a Uranus and Neptune missions as well, just for fun. Um, yeah. Richard, how about you? Unlimited budget. What would you build? Um, well, if I had an unlimited budget, I might approach it a little differently. You know, I, I think the ideas that we just heard coming in from the community are fantastic. And that's really the purpose of the workshop, to get new ideas. And there are different combinations of instruments, approaches that you could use for, you know, searching for life. And they would, might vary depending on your target. If I had an unlimited budget, though, I honestly would probably take a core set of instruments. And really, we've been thinking about this for a long time. So we have some really solid approaches. And rather than spend a lot of money on you know, developing an instrument, I would spend that money to make many, many, many copies of that same instrument and send it to many, many, many places. So I think that the need in terms of budget is actually more missions um, rather than necessarily bigger budget for instruments. Um, you know, the, the, the more we can look, the frequency that we can look increases the probability of success. So that's how I would spend the money instead of a mission every couple of years, I would have a mission every month. Oh, interesting. I love that. Yeah. Again, we're on a limited budget, right? So we can just, you know, we can do a mission every month. And that's fantastic. I love it. Um, so I, I, I do have a few more minutes in my own questioning here with you. I want to remind our audience watching on YouTube that you can ask questions in the chat right now, and they will come through to my teleprompter for me to ask of Drs. Getty and Quinn. Um, I see some questions coming in already, so please keep those coming. Uh, I want to come back now, uh, Stephanie. You mentioned this idea of bringing samples back from the field to maybe our, our, you know, our higher precision, higher end instrumentation that we have in the laboratory at NASA centers and at other institutions. 
Um, but you know, when it comes to returning samples from space, that's a much different process. It's far more expensive. There's infrastructure that has to be built around getting missions out there to collect samples and, and bring them back. And in the case of Mars, for instance, there's a large infrastructure that we still have to develop to to get samples back from Perseverance right now. I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about the trade-offs of you know, developing these infrastructures for sample return compared to developing better infrastructure for instrumentation in space. Yeah, I mean, the answer is both, please. Um, obviously, we can do so much with laboratory instruments that just can't be done in the institution. But at the same time, when you're exploring scientifically a new environment, um, you know, I think a the best approach is really an interplay between in situ missions and sample return missions where it's possible. I mean, there are some sample return missions that are kind of beyond uh, near term capabilities, obviously, just for proximity reasons. Um, but even for return missions, I mean, without the in situ science, it can be really hard to convince yourself that you're going to the right location. I mean, uh, that you're picking up the best sample for return to Earth. And as you know, there's a lot, as you mentioned, Graham, there's a lot riding on that return, right? So you want to know enough about the environment to be able to interpret the results like we were talking about before. And that can't be done without thinking about the science of the system. And so that really requires sustained questioning of like what what that system is and how it came to be and how it's different from um, other places we've seen before. And, you know, Richard, you mentioned too, all planetary environments are not one thing. Think about Mars and how varied the surface geology is. And we, we haven't even started to explore the subsurface, right? And we think about an ocean world like Enceladus. Um, there are several environmental targets there. Um, the plume at the southern pole, the icy surface that expresses signatures of the ocean, potentially directly visiting the ocean, um, you know, in the future. So no single mission can visit all of those environments in situ, but we we have to like be, um, cont we have to be satisfied, not really, but we have to be, our curiosity has to uh, be somewhat happy with building upon um, those questions that get answered, you know, in a sequential way um, with missions building upon previous missions and then, you know, getting inspired by the next set of questions. Um, so I, I think that there's definitely a, a good role and imp importance to, um, to both in situ and sample return missions. And I love that so much. And I love this idea of missions building upon missions and kind of, you know, expanding what we know. And, and uh, you know, what you said there too kind of reminds me of this importance of context in, in, in the environment and understanding where these samples come from. All three of us are, are part of the Center for Life Detection, uh, headquartered at NASA Ames, which is one of the three main pieces of the Network for Life Detection, or NFOLD. Um, you know, and, and with the Center for Life Detection, right now we're, we're building something called the Life Detection Knowledge Base, which will allow scientists in the community to come together and to explore not just you know, the, the, the biogenicity of certain features, but also their context, which is really important. Uh, and Richard, for, for you, you're not only a part of the Center for Life Detection, but also on the steering committee for now. Um, I wonder if you could talk a bit about um, the maybe the, the, the challenges of taking instruments to icy worlds and using them in those places and, and the context of those environments, which are very different from the environments we have here on Earth. Sure, absolutely. But if you want, I would like to just add a little bit to the question that you that you posed to Stephanie, because as a, you know, uh, somebody whose career has been in situ exploration. Now, initially, sample return, I thought, well, it's expensive, it's unnecessary. Um, but my thought has shifted over years because I think what we've learned from Mars exploration is that um, an expression of the presence of life is going to be subtle. Um, and so that makes it important to bring samples back. Because as much as we learn uh, with in situ instruments, and even if we, uh, you know, when we hit on a signal and we think, okay, we've done it, we found it, um, still those, it has to be confirmed. And I think that confirmation really does need to be done in, in the laboratory. Um, so I am, like Stephanie said, I think both are hand in hand. Um, now the question about ocean worlds, and, and in recent years I have pivoted um, you know, to, to look in farther out to those types of missions. And um, again, going into, you know, environmental context, of course, the, the environments are 
radically different compared to how we would explore for, say, for Mars exploration, particularly um, uh, a destination like the European surface, which was a, you know, a focus of a potential mission in the future, where you have this incredible radiation um, um, environment that really um, alters and distorts, um, you know, any feature or any artifact that you may expect to see uh, relative to the presence of life. And, you know, going back, I think we see on Mars um, the, the tremendous um, challenges that the radiation environment imposes on the search for life or even just doing the science there from the whole uh, elevated oxidation chemistry, the perchlorate, the, um, the search for organic signatures that have been altered um, both um, in the environment and also in the sample processing during um, uh, during exploration, those challenges are just compounded when we move out to ocean worlds, particularly um, moving out to a place like Europa. Mm, very cool. You know, with Enceladus, for instance, we were with Cassini very lucky that we had the, the ion and neutral mass spectrometer on Cassini. We could actually fly through these plumes of water, and, and there might be plumes from Europa. It's not out of the question. There's actually some data that has suggested there could be European plumes as well. Um, and so one instrument, for instance, being developed for Europa Clipper called SUDA uh, could, could not just explore the dust and, and materials around Europa, but also potentially explore for plumes there. And so there's a bit of serendipity, too, that comes into this, right, with discovering plumes from an ocean world that we didn't expect. And, and who knows if we go to Uranus or Neptune, what other weird things are happening on moons in our solar system that we have no idea about. Uh, so I wonder for both of you, um, before I open it up to the audience questions here, if we could just briefly talk about the future of instrument development and data analysis. Um, what are the key things you think we should be prepared for or maybe be open to in the very near future? Um, and Stephanie, I think I'll start with you. Um, you know, not just serendipity, but also just some of the things you think are, are key things we should be prepared for. Yeah, um, I, you know, I think go, moving forward in, um, in in situ analysis, I think, what you touched on there, Graham, with um, being prepared for what the what the uh, what the environment has to present to you, uh, and being able to um, you know to adapt to uh, really what the what the sampling <laughs> uh, needs to look like to get the right sample into um, into your instrumentation uh, is is a really important factor. Um, I think that for you know as we become more sophisticated in the way that we explore certain environments, um, we uh, we have the opportunity to you know build from. Um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, an approach where you learn what you can from a particular fraction that's accessible with what, uh, with the instrumentation that you have to trying to get the most, tease out the most information out of, um, out of the samples that are accessible. So that means, you know, paying really close attention to how cleanly you're sampling, um, how, uh, um, how carefully you're treating that sample as you're moving it between different elements of, um, of a, a payload, for example, making, taking great care not to alter that sample and, and, uh, confusing yourself. <laughs> That you're seeing at the end of the day, and then just really making the most of all that sample has to offer to you. Um, I think, um, you know, I think there there's a there's an evolution in instrumentation, um, and uh, and I'm really excited to see the energy um, that uh, that we're hearing in this workshop and from the community and really treating the hard problems about how to get um, the, the right sample and the right fidelity of sample into our instrumentation. Yeah, it's the, always the scientists, right? Samples. Um, it reminds me of an avatar of the character. She's like, we get samples. <laughs> you know, we, we need to know the samples. We also need to know where they come from and, and how they've been treated. And uh, I really appreciate that take. Um, Richard, how about you? What do you think is the future for, for instrument development? Well, I, I agree 100% with what Stephanie just said. I think, you know, a lot of times when we talk about instruments, you'll hear people say, well, my instrument has a sensitivity of parts per trillion, and, or, you know, it can do this, this can do that. And really what they're talking about there is they're talking about the detector. They're, you know, so they're summing up their instrument in terms of the detector. But as Stephanie just pointed out, really, the challenges is sample access, sample handling, and sample processing. 
Because if you have an instrument, particularly, you know, an, an in-situ instrument that needs to ingest or it needs to take a sample uh, to, to get a result, the form of that sample is really what drives your ability to make a, a proper analysis and proper interpretation of the data. So I agree 100 percent. The real challenge is, is to future exploration is, is the sample um, acquisition, sample processing. Very cool. Uh, I, I love you so much right now, and I have so many more questions of my own, but I also have to be a good host and respect our audience and allow them to ask some questions too. And when one that actually came to us through an email at info at seganet.org was from a person who I know named Bob Bruner. Uh, he's an 83-year-old man who, who works as a volunteer at our local museum uh, here in Denver, the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. He's been developing uh, this idea for some time of, of sharing with children and families the kinds of minerals we look for on Mars. But he wanted to know, since it's not his area of expertise, um, about spectrometers that we use in orbit. And I, I wonder if you could speak maybe to remote sensing uh, from orbit or you know, even from telescopes from far away compared to using instrumentation in situ. And that could be for either of you, honestly. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab here. I mean, that's a tough question because I am really an in situ, you know, where I want a sample, I want the instrument to touch it, um, interrogate it. Um, I, I think that, that you know, r remote sensing is going to, in terms of light detection, uh, you know, eventually will be particularly relevant for, um, for exoplanets and looking at atmospheres and trying to understand, um, you know, are these, is, do they have atmospheres that are indicative processes that might suggest the presence of life? Um, I think that there's been a tremendous amount of work done, um, you know, remotely, in terms of Mars, just our ability to understand the whole planet. And really, when we landed there in 1976, we saw this landscape of, of just, you know, red dust everywhere. And for a long time, people thought, well, that's the planet. But really, it was the remote sensing that really, before we even got back to the planet again, you know, 20, more than 20 years later, really, really gave us an in-depth understanding of the habitability, the potential for life. So understanding those mineral assemblages, the geology is really critical, and that's all achieved through remote sensing, not all of them. And I'll just add to that, Richard. You know what you're uh, you're you're referring to also just the the connection I think between what you can learn remote sensing on a planetary global scale, particularly if you're if you have an orbiter, which is like the dream of many <laughs> geologists, is to have global mapping um, of of, a, of an entire planet at sufficient resolution so that you can de you know de decipher um, some of the signatures on the surface and trace it back to uh, geological processes that that we might already know and then that gives you such amazing context for in situ exploration because oftentimes you're picking one place or one region of the surface um, of the surface of a planet and um, you know there, there is surface mobility, but but often you need you when you want to understand how this um, this particular region or landing site um, you know relates to the planetary uh, processes at large. You need that global understanding. So there's absolutely um, you know importance in remote sensing, uh, um, not only for global mapping, but just global you know more um, larger context. You you don't throw away any of your uh, of your wavelengths, right, that are coming off the surface at you. So you can tell different things about the surface, um, whether it's, you know, uh, mineralogy or, um, or uh, um, you know, water, potentially hydrated mineral all these things can be, can be uh, and I'm not an expert in this, so forgive me for those who are experts out there, um, but, but you can learn quite a lot um, within the resolution limitations, of course, um, but by remote sensing, um, we're, we're uh, not to talk too much about Da Vinci, but we're, um, you know, we have two elements to our mission. One will do a couple of flybys of the planet um, and uh, with some remote sensing capabilities um, and look at the clouds, look at cloud dynamics, look at cloud chemistry, 
uh, look at the night side of the planet, see if we can peer through the clouds in certain wavelengths and tell something about the um, the rock types on the surface, and then connect that to our descent imagery as our probe goes through the clouds. I mean, the clouds are hard on Venus, and uh, and so um, remote sensing certainly has uh, provides context, um, you know, but it's it's uh, it's a it's a complement to uh, to in situ investigation. I love that. And I love you know, the scale of these different ways of looking, but also the complementation, you know, complementary nature of, of these orbiters and landers and things like that. I, I know with Europa Clipper, for instance, at first, you know, some of us thought we would get like little micro landers or little things that would, would drop off the, the spacecraft. That didn't happen in the end, unfortunately. I, I really wish it had. Um, but maybe in the future, we'll see more of these complementary missions that have the orbiter, lander, maybe even rover, all as, you know, one package together. Um, we do have one question that came in from Anouk uh, Eraser. Uh, I apologize, Anouk, if that's not the correct pronunciation. Uh, Anouk has asked, uh, what would you say is the main limitation for scientific instruments on Mars rovers? Is it power availability, size, the weight, robustness of instruments for space missions? Um, and I guess, Stephanie, I'll, I'll start with you. What do you think are the main limitations for, for our scientific instruments? Um, yeah, Mars, well, so Mars in particular is hard um, from the perspective that there's enough atmosphere to try to kill you on the way down, but not enough um, to really make it easy on you. Like Venus is easy because there's a huge amount of atmosphere and you need a tiny parachute <laughs> for only part of your descent, right? But um, but for Mars, the, the the atmosphere is in this zone where you need huge parachutes and you also need like, you know, oftentimes some other uh, mechanism to help you land um, safely. And so what that translates to is, of course, limitations on how much you can land um, in terms of mass and, uh, um, and capability. And so I... It, um, I mean, obviously, to fit inside a rocket fairing, you you have some limitations to your volume, um, and there's a trade-off in volume between how many different capabilities you can send and how big those capabilities are. Um, and so, so you so you somehow just find this optimum <laughs> for the particular opportunity that you have that you know, that fits within your fairing that can be landed with uh, you know, safely onto the surface of the planet, if that's your mission goal. Um, and, uh, and it has enough breadth to be able to, um, you know, to put your core discoveries into context um, in that environment. I don't know if that helps. It's very, very helpful. Uh, and actually, we have a second question from Anouk that I think I'm going to answer first. So Anouk says, I use Raman spectroscopy in my research. I'm a big fan. What are the limitations that stop us from putting a very sensitive Raman spectroscope on Mars and looking for organics? Um, Anouk, we have a Raman spectroscope on Mars, and it can look for organics um, on Perseverance, the Sherlock instrument. Uh, I also use Raman spectroscopy in my graduate research uh, and am super excited for Perseverance and for Sherlock. Um, and so, Richard, maybe for you, um, what are the limitations we've had in getting some of these more, these newer kind of uh, instrumental approaches onto some of our rovers and, and our spacecraft? Well, I think you, know, you take something like Sherlock, we are putting new technologies and new approaches on these rovers. Um, so I don't think it's it's an issue of the technologies, but I agree with, with Stephanie. Every mission has multiple objectives. And to, to achieve multiple objectives, you have to have multiple instruments, multiple instruments types that need to share resources. And so particularly on a rover, you have all sorts of resource limitations. So I think that that, that um, you know, each, each time we go, the ro rovers get bigger and more capable. Um, but still, I think that that's a, a primary limitation. We, we try to do a number of different things and we need a number of different tools to do that. Um, and so that, that, you know, spreads resources around. Yeah. Very good. Um, we have a question from John Rosenfeld, who now wants to switch to Titan. Um, and John wants to know if there could be methane-based life. I imagine John's thinking of maybe metabolisms that rely on producing and, and probably more, more likely consuming uh, methane, so methanotrophs perhaps. Um, so John wants to know what kinds of scientific instruments you think we would need to detect, to detect these life forms that could be in a place like Titan, perhaps eating methane. <laughs> That's a, I, well. We're not going to solve this here, but um, <laughs> uh, but I think it's a 
It's a valid question. I mean, I think that we're, um, and I'm going to hand it over to Richard in, in a second. There are two things I want to say. First thing is that we're still in the, um, uh, um, at the level of understanding at Titan that we're still asking basic questions about what the, you know, the resources are for any life form there. We know that it's cold there. We know that there's liquid there. That's great. We know there's ice, water ice there. That's also cool. Um, uh, and we know that there's a really rich atmosphere that is a laboratory for organic chemistry, which is really cool um, and definitely prebiotically um, important, if not biologically active right now. Um, but with with Dragonfly, and I'm not on the Dragonfly mission, so forgive me if I get anything wrong. Um, but th with Dragonfly, we're going to ask those really foundational questions about what the current chemistry is, what the cycles are, how the surface expresses those different cycles, what variability there is uh, across the surface. For those who don't know, Dragonfly is a quadcopter with aerial mobility that will land repeatedly um, in uh, in different regions of uh, Saturn's moon Titan and um, and take analyses, take in samples and analyze those samples and look at variability in the chemistry of the surface environment and atmosphere, near surface atmosphere of Titan um, through the course of that mission. So that's really exciting because it's like um, we're, we're on the verge of understanding an incredible amount about Titan where we can then kind of engage um, our best thinkers on uh, the fundamentals of biology and, um, and start to ask questions about what a metabolism would look like, right? Um, but I think, and, and let me say that Dragonfly, I mean, that instrument suite, the payload suite is, um, is capable of making really broad analytical measurements that can be interpreted and debated probably, right? <laughs> about what they mean. Um, so that, that mission is a good example of where you can incorporate instrumentation. You can, uh, you know, include instrumentation in your payload that's capable of really broad scientific inquiry and prepared to discover new things. And that is the, one of the really, really exciting things. Very cool. And, you know, drones are so hot right now, um, but Dragonfly is going someplace super cold. Uh, the surface of Titan is very cold, perhaps too cold for, for me metabolisms at the surface. And so, so Richard, um, if you can answer the question as well, but also I I'd ask, uh, uh, what would we have to take to get into the subsurface of Titan as well? Um, well, the first part of the question, I'll, I'll, I, I, again, I agree with Stephanie completely. You know, we can look back to Viking and the first mission to Viking, they were, it's going to be light detection. And three of their four primary instruments were all about trying to dig up a little bit of soil and trying to grow microbes in it. Um, and so what did we miss in that mission? Well, we missed the opportunity to get some of the real fundamental understanding of the environment that we then did with follow-on missions. And we really changed our strategy, as Stephanie has already mentioned, you know, step by step, building on your knowledge. Titan is a incredibly alien um, environment that we really don't know much about at all. And so the strategy that's being used, as Stephanie pointed out, is to really start out increasing our fundamental understanding of that environment. And from there, we can start developing hypotheses about the potential for life and how that might be investigated. Mm, very cool. And so I'm going to switch gears here a little bit. Next question is something interesting. Um, it's something near and dear to my heart, but um, I'll let you choose if you, if you want to answer this. Uh, William Kramer on YouTube has asked, um, where we have experiments that can grab samples, um, you know, in situ, so grabbing up some regolith that might contain ET life, um, is there a consideration of the bioethical consequences of potentially harming any life in the sample? Um, and so I'll start, um, since I'm currently working on a, a collaboration with the artist Lucia Monge, uh, she and I are going to be growing ornamental plants in, in Martian regolith and Martian conditions, specifically on Martian time with the extra 40 minutes of day length. Um, however, we're also thinking about not just the, the impacts to the plants, but also the impacts to the humans as well as the ethics, uh, the ethical consequences of putting other organisms into these conditions. And so this is kind of important for my own work in considering, you know, how do we treat other life out there? Um, so I wonder for either of you in your own conversations, um, perhaps in the workshop, have, have anything around this kind of theme of, of bioethics come up at all? 
Well, so I, I would say that 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 part of that is, you know, falls within a broader discussion that we have all the time about forward contamination of another planet. And that has concerns that span from, you know, ethical concerns to scientific concerns. So I would say that the community or, or you know, planetary sciences, it is something that is thought about and is considered. Um, and, and, and our approaches to exploration are, you know, also take that into account in terms of planetary protection requirements or, you know, ability to, you know, contaminate the planet and also to contaminate our own science. That's a very interesting Actually, we have another question from Anouk again. He's asking some really good ones here. Uh, Anouk uh, wants to know, with the possible contamination uh, of Mars from human habitation, um, how might that affect our search for current or, or past life on Mars? I can answer that one. It's, or especially if it's Mars, because I, you know, I've thought about this quite a bit. And, and you know, so there's two parts of, or there's, you know, it's sort of a continuum, right? There'll be the first discovery of life um, that'll happen sometime, hopefully in the very near future. Um, but we could compare that to, say, the search for exoplanets. After the first exoplanet was discovered, that field exploded, trying to understand where they are, how many they are, what's their nature. I think with human exploration, the same thing is going to happen. Um, there will be, it will increase um, the effort to search for life by orders of magnitude. So it's not, it's not a negative, it's actually a positive. And I would put it in comparison also to the research that people do here on Earth, right? We're constantly out in the field trying to understand the origin of life on Earth. And the presence of humans, well, no matter how much we pollute, we're still searching that answer and, and we're still successful. I don't think that, um, you know, the, the, the signs of life um, are, are vast and diverse. And I don't think we're going to be confusing, um, say, ancient fossil records on Mars with contemporary contamination that come from humans. So I see that, you know, the, the human exploration part of Mars really just expands our ability to understand uh, the potential for life on Mars and its potential distribution. So I, I look really forward to it. And I'll just add, if we have um, uh, you know, a couple of things, that's a really excellent answer. Um, but, you know, we're tackling... We're tackling similar questions already um, in terms of how do we distinguish between what we've brought and um, and what's you know in indigenous to the sample or to the environment. And so um, you know, uh, so far we've tackled that most explicitly for chemical signatures, right? Um, so we um, we typically missions exercise a very rigorous contamination control plans to um, to document what you're sending and to understand how um, those signatures might be expressed by um, in situ you know analyses once you get to a place the uh, the other analogy is um, you know looking at uh, a a analyzing meteorites for prebiotic um, compounds like nucleobases amino acids Oxalic acids. I mean, routinely, not routinely. It takes a lot of effort, but we've come up with a protocol for um, for establishing which of those amino acids are most likely to have originated beyond Earth in prebiotic chemical pathways on um, on these you know uh, primitive bodies, and which are contamination from Earth. And that comes from like you know just the prevalence of those amino acids in life on Earth versus you know what we're um, what are, are very convincingly outside of the typical regime of life that you would see um, uh, terrestrially. So I think that we have a lot of great thinking to build upon um, to try to tackle some of these challenges. I mean, you know, I think um, preparation is good and folding in some of these concerns into uh, plans, not only for robotic, but for future human missions is important. And I know that thinking is going on. Um, but also, you know, we have good strategies for um, for being able to differentiate between the origin of signals. That's fantastic. Um, so many important things there. And I'm going to switch the gears a little bit more here again. So we, we switched to like philosophy and bioethics. Um, our next question is more in the realm of space law. And it comes from Adam Robinson on YouTube. And so we'll see uh, how much you wish to answer this question. Um, Adam kind of wants to know, 
um, should we create laws or policy um, to control where private companies, um, and I would actually add any government agency as well, uh, from going to certain areas, perhaps on Mars or another world, that we've deemed potentially habitable or that could be a good place to find signs of past or present life. Um, this kind of reminds me of the, the concept of planetary parks, for instance. Should we have preserved areas of some of these worlds where, for instance, we don't send a rover because it might just be that nice and pristine and we don't want to ruin anything? Um, Stephanie, what do, you, what do you think about that? Well, I'm a big fan of national parks on Earth, so yes. No, <laughs> I don't know. That, um, I, it's obviously outside of my field, but um, but I think uh, you know that there are good examples of where um, people from different uh, um, you know political like different you know countries have come together and come to agreements of, about how to um, uh, you know rules of exploration and and uh, and some common. Um, values that we have in, in, uh, exploring, um, space. And, um, and I think, you know, the future is that there are, uh, there's a proliferation of, um, entities that are capable of pushing, um, exploration even further. And so we should, uh, I think we should acknowledge it and, and bring together, uh, um, you know, all interested parties into those discussions, but I, sorry, I'm like really, out on a limb here. I love that answer. <laughs> and I guess, so we actually are coming down to the top of the hour and I'm going to be a little selfish here and ask you one more question that I think is kind of fun. Um, so for myself, I, I was inspired at five years old to become a scientist by watching an, an, an 80s movie that had some rock and roll in it and talked about mathematics. And, you know, through my life, I was inspired by things like Star Trek and, and Star Wars. Um, I wonder for both of you, is there anything in like science fiction or, or literature, film, comic books or novels, things that, you know, that others have created, maybe even art that has inspired you to pursue these careers that you've both taken on in your lives? And, and Richard, I'd like to start with you. Is there anything that's really inspired you to pursue this life? Well, uh, I, I started my career in science education, working at the National Science Foundation, and I never actually thought I'd become a planetary science or, or an astrobiologist. Um, and I can also say that I'm not a big fan of science fiction, um, but, but, but what I do love is the process of discovery. And if I were going to read a book, it actually might be, um, you know, it would be a biography or it might be a historic something about history, because the difference between science fiction and us is we're real. And what we're doing is very, very real. And, and, and pursuing that and really understanding the real challenges um, I think is really what what makes this job great. Oh, that's fantastic. How about you? It's inspired you and your career. I'll be really quick. Um, so, Cosmos, the original Cosmos series, Carol Sagan was on all the time when I was a kid. So, obviously, that played a huge role. Um, I also remember being like a tween ish and um, and really pushing myself. I picked up a brief history of time by Stephen Hawking from the bookstore, and I really pushed myself to. Um, to read it, even though I wasn't convinced I could, right? Um, but but that was a huge source of information of inspiration, not only to like inspire my love of you know the universe, exploring the universe, but also to build my own confidence that these are concepts that are not beyond me, and you know I could pursue hard science in my studies. Oh, that's wonderful! Um, I'm so happy you both joined us for this show today. Uh, I'm so glad you were both inspired to pursue these careers and become astrobiologists and planetary scientists and and help us to continue exploring and being curious. Uh, the Future of the Search for Life workshop is continuing in two more weeks from now. There's still more to tackle and more work for these communities you're bringing together. Uh, for our audience watching right now at home, even if you can't take part in the, in the workshop, um, if you're interested in telling us what do you think are the main challenges in bringing together the technology and the science of life protection, uh, feel free to reach out on Twitter, at NASA Astrobio, or at Saganorg, or you can find me at Cosmobiologist, uh, or you can email us at info at uh, So Dr. Stephanie Getty, Dr. Richard Quinn, thank you so much for joining us for Ask an Astrobiologist. Thanks so much, Graham. That was fun. Great having you on. Um, if anyone out there watching wants to stay in the loop about info and opportunities from NASA Astrobiology, uh, we'll drop a link in the screen in the chat so you can sign up for our official mailing list to learn more. 
about all the wonderful things NASA astrobiology is doing. Uh, so to, to all of you out there who've been exploring with us and learning more, uh, thanks for joining. And until next time, remember to stay curious.